Welcome back to the shop and to the channel. A while ago I picked up this Dorian right angle milling machine attachment at auction. Uh, I got it for a really great price and it was utterly filthy. I did clean up the outside of it a bit, but I want to see what it looks like on the inside. I don't have an immediate need for this, but I do want to give it a good clean on the inside, check out the bearings, make sure those are good. Get all the old crusty grease that's probably inside of this thing out and get some new lubrication in there so that when I do need it, it's ready to go and I'm not having to stop what I'm working on in order to take care of this. Well, I couldn't find a parts diagram for this thing that I trusted. Um, I did find something that is similar to this, so it's probably close enough. So some of this I'm doing a bit blind, and I'm not real sure the order that I should be taking this thing apart. But uh, I think that should be pretty evident the further I go. Dorian is still in business, and they still sell this thing for a lot of money. But I tried to contact them through their website, and either they don't monitor their inbox or they didn't care enough to respond. Uh, I wanted to try to get some drawings for this from them and a manual that would tell me what kind of grease or oil this thing is supposed to take, but I guess I will just have to wing it. On the side here, there are two clamping bolts that clamp this to the quill, and then there's this jack bolt that's in the center. And that jack bolt is used to spread the casting to make it easier to get it on the quill. Then you loosen that up before you tighten the clamping bolts. Well, there's this countersunk cap screw on the back of the spindle that I believe is used to lock the threads onto the spindle so that way this uh, nut, I guess I'll call it, can't back off. But I can't seem to loosen it without the spindle turning. So I'm going to give this some thought and I'll come back to it later. Well, down inside the top of this thing is a great big snap ring that I'm sure has to come out at some point. So I'm going to get my uh, big snap ring pliers here and we'll see if we can't get them on that snap ring and get that at least removed from the inside of it. Well, I think the, the lugs on the ends of these tips are just a little bit too big, so I need to take these off, put on some smaller ones to see if they'll fit into the holes on the end of the snap ring. Well, the snap ring came out with... Uh, with just a little bit of trouble, but I was managed to get it out. I'm going to try to get this thread locking screw out of here because I think I need to try to get this spindle out of it next. Well, grabbing onto this with a gloved hand didn't work. Um, and I can't put this into the milling machine because I don't have a draw bar for this yet. I still need to make one. So maybe a wrench on the uh, input side of this thing will hold it enough yep that I can get that uh, screw out of there and then try to get this uh, um, back of the spindle this nut or whatever on the back of the spindle off well with that screw out of there this uh, spindle nut should come off easier uh, not easy but easier I don't have a spanner wrench that I can put on this not that I think it would matter because, again, I still need to hold the input spindle at least steady in order to even try to get that off. So I'm going to think about this for a little bit. And what I'm thinking right now is I might try just an impact approach. I can't really hold the spindle steady, but I think if I were to, say, take a punch and put it in one of those spanner holes and just give it a good wrap with a hammer that that might be enough to jar it loose
Well, with that spindle nut off, I can now take the spindle out. And this should come out the front here. It's going to be a tight fit, I'm sure, in uh, the, the bearings. But I'm going to use my brass hammer and a brass punch, and I should be able to get it out fairly easy. Well, this thing is completely packed with old grease and quite frankly I'm not sure if this thing's supposed to take grease or if it's supposed to be sitting in oil. Uh, I've gotten some different answers doing some searches online. Again I wish that I could get a response from Dorian. Maybe I could know for sure. If any of you out there have a Dorian right angle milling attachment, maybe you have an, an owner's or operator's manual that would tell whether or not I should be putting grease in this and what kind of grease I should put in it or is this supposed to be sitting in in oil if you know drop a comment in the bottom let me know there are a pair of bevel gears inside of this that transmit the vertical spindle operation to the horizontal spindle in this right angle milling attachment and what, what I want to do now is try to get that bearing out and this shaft that attaches to one of those bevel gears. Using a brass drift here and a hammer to get some pressure on that bevel gear, which will, you know, hopefully press out the bearing. Now, ideally, I'd want to get to the outside of the bearing versus hitting on the gear, but I have no access to that from where this is so this is really the only way I can see to get that part out I was a little nervous trying to get that out, but I think it came out okay. I think it was the only way I could get this out. Again, it's completely packed full of grease. I do want to check out the bearing. It does feel like it's okay-ish, but uh, not until I get this disassembled the rest of the way and cleaned up am I going to know for sure. With that bevel gear out of the way, I now have access to the front bearing. This will be a little easier to remove. There is just a ton of grease inside this thing, and I am I'm kind of baffled as to why, especially when I'm using, uh, or this thing why is using bearings, sealed bearings. Why would you use sealed bearings and then pack this thing full of grease? Maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm not really sure. Well, there is no good camera angle here for me to show you what I'm doing, but I'm basically using my brass punch on the mating bevel gear that's still inside of here. It's the one that's coming from the vertical input part of this milling attachment. Uh, I need to kind of straddle this on a couple of pieces of wood, and I'm just tapping on the top of that bevel gear, and it should come out of the bottom here. Well, it looks like there's another snap ring here that holds this bevel gear onto the input shaft. So we'll use some uh, right angle 
snap ring plier, see if we can't get this off, and then remove the gear. Well, since I was able to get the other bevel gear off of the input shaft, I might as well go ahead and take this bearing off of the other one. Although this is going to be a little bit tricky because I don't really have a good way of holding this without it slipping off of my little uh, bench blocks here. We'll see what we can kind of come up with. I'm sure I can figure it out. Well, with that off of there, I can assess the condition of these bearings, and quite frankly, they feel fine. Uh, I imagine the grease that's inside of these things are nasty, but I think overall they are in really good condition, and I don't see any reason why I would need to go to the expense of replacing them. Well, I spent a little bit of time cleaning up all of the parts on the wire wheel, and also in the parts washer and everything came out really nice. Um, I am going to address these bearings though even though I am going to use them as they are. I do want to go ahead and clean out the insides of the ball bearing cage itself and reapply some grease. The first thing I need to do is carefully remove the seal on one side of the bearing and I'm just going to use a little pick here and try to just carefully get in between the rubber and the inner race. Uh, it's pretty flexible right here and if you're careful and you get a pick underneath it and just slide it a little bit that that seal will come loose of that side of the bearing and it's just a matter of peeling it off. Yeah, that grease looks pretty nasty, so we'll do the same thing to the other side and also to the other two bearings. Well, I took the bearings over to the parts washer and used a little PSC 1000 to clean out all the old grease. For new grease, I'm going to use this uh, Mobile, Mobile X EP1. This is a really good general purpose grease. I don't want to put too much into these bearings because if you overpack them you could end up creating an overheating issue. So I'm just going to put enough in here to cover the the cage. I don't want to pack it too full and then that also makes it difficult to get the shields back on. Well, with the grease in one side, I need to put the shield back on, and that's pretty easy to do. Just need to line it up with the races and just press it in. It will snap in and uh, find its spot in there, and it should be pretty secure. Just make sure it is uh, set in all the way around the entire circumference of the seal. With the front side finished, I can turn them over. We'll apply some more grease and then set the shields in place. Well, these are all clean of any excess grease, so they're ready to go back into the milling attachment. Well, I can start putting this back together. I'll get the input shaft reassembled. I got this big washer slash spacer that goes on the R8 spindle first. And now I need to reassemble the bevel gear and the uh, bearing. The spacer goes on first and then the bearing presses onto the bevel gear. There's a keyway on the input shaft and this small key that needs to be seated and that will mate with the bevel gear. Just need to line up the key and the keyway in the bevel gear and it should slide in. It take a little bit of extra effort to get it all the way in but then that exposes the snap ring groove on the top of the shaft. 
I use these same snap ring pliers to mount the snap ring and uh, use a screwdriver here just to make sure that it's properly seated in that groove. I think it would be could be pretty catastrophic if that snap ring comes off and the bevel gear somehow becomes dislodged or gets chewed up between the two gears. With the input shaft now assembled, I can go ahead and mount it back into the housing. Now, there's no real easy way to hold this thing, so I've got a squeeze clamp here. And I'm hoping I can grab the head of this milling attachment and at least hold this thing up and down while I try to get this bearing mounted into the housing. Well, I now can go ahead and seat this bearing. I'm using this, this brass uh, drift again, and I'm hitting on the outside race of the bearing until it's seated all the way into the housing. With the bearing seated all the way, um, it is held in with this big snap ring. So I've got my snap ring pliers again, and there's a, a groove that gets exposed by the bearing when it's all the way to depth that the snap ring fits into capturing the bearing in position. Well, with the input spindle installed, I can go ahead and install the output spindle by first seating the uh, front bearing. With the bearing in place, I can now install the spindle and I'm just going to tap this home through that uh, inner race of the bearing and I'm going to drive it all the way in until it seats fully on that inner race. Well, before I put any more inside of this, I want to get some grease in here. Again, I'm pretty sure this is going to take some grease, but part of me thinks that this thing's supposed to be sitting in oil. That zerk on the side of it could be an oil zerk or could be a grease zerk. You know, again, I'm not sure what Dorian expected users to do when this thing was originally made but for now I'm going to put some grease in here if I need to load this thing with grease I can always do that through the zerk and if it's supposed to sit in oil this little bit of grease that I am putting in here sh shouldn't be a problem it'll just end up dissolving in the oil before I can install the mating uh, bevel gear I need to get this key installed in the keyway of the output spindle and before I put that mating bevel gear on here, I'll put a little more of that uh, grease on the teeth of the bevel gear, and then I can slide it over the spindle onto that keyway. Well, the next thing that goes on is the rear bearing, and this needs to be seated down into the housing as well as around that bevel gear. This bearing needs to be seated fairly deep into the housing, so I'll use a punch and a hammer and go around the circumference of the bearing and just slowly work my way until it's seated all the way down into the housing. Well, once that's seated all the way, it will expose another snap ring groove here. So I've got a snap ring, my snap ring pliers, and that will, again, hold that bearing in position. Well, something didn't quite feel right when I had the together, and when I looked on the bench, I realized I forgot to put a spacer in. So this bearing that's on the rear of the output spindle actually needs to be seated even further in order to make room for spacer, and then the snap ring goes on over that. Well, with that mistake uh, corrected and sorted, I can reinstall the spindle now, making sure I line up that keyway in that bevel gear. Well, the last part of this whole spindle assembly is this nut that's on the back of the spindle. I'll tighten it down to 
about what I believe it was when I took it apart. I'll just use a punch and do the same thing. Give it sort of a little bit of a wrap with a hammer and that should put it about where it was before. And this screw then basically locks those threads together so it can't back off or go on any tighter. One of the last little bits that we need to do is reinstall the grease slash oil zerk. Still got to figure that out. And the clamping bolts. I chose not to do anything like painting it because I felt like the paint on it was in pretty good condition. It's got a couple of chips in it, but that's not such a big deal. And it operates nice and smooth. Um, it does feel really good. The bearings feel good. The only thing we got to do now is to try to install it and... In order to do that, we need to make a new drawbar. Well, the way this thing mounts to the bridge port is you mount it like you would a collet, except this goes around the quill of the spindle. Now, the thing that makes it interesting is that you've got to lower the quill in order to install this, which means that this drawbar that I have right now will be too low into the machine and I won't be able to put a wrench on it to tighten it. So there's no way for me to install this unless I add a few more inches to this drawbar. Well, I need to make a drawbar that's about three and a half inches longer than this standard one. I've got this piece of scrap that should give me a pretty good starting point. I also have this piece of 7 16 inch round bar that will work perfectly for the threaded end of the draw bar. Let's go over to the lathe and get started. With that piece cut off, I'll go ahead and put in a turning tool here so I can face off the end. And this is going to be the end that will have the um, hex uh, cut into it for the wrench. So I'll go ahead and put in a nice heavy chamfer first before turning this around so I can face and drill the other side. We've got a drill in the tailstock here that is one size smaller than a 7 16 inch reamer and so we'll drill this to depth and then come back and ream it to size. I got a section of this round bar cut off that'll act as the draw bar here and we'll chuck it up in the lathe and clean off all this rust off of it. I've got a 7 16 20 die that I'll use to thread a good portion of this that will be used to mate with the input spindle on the milling attachment. I want to make sure that I thread at least what is on the standard draw bar, so I'll just mark it here with the Sharpie and make sure that I thread at least up to that point. And before we get started here, I'll put a little anchor lube on the end of the rod. Well, I don't know how well this is going to work because unfortunately I do not have a die holder for one inch hex dies. I thought I did, otherwise I would have gone ahead and ordered one. So I'm going to use the tailstock here and a wrench to see if I can't get this threaded. And if this doesn't work very well, I suppose I can always single point thread that, but I was hoping to avoid needing to do that. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I will say that did not go very well at first. The first parts of these threads are just absolutely hideous. If there are any, I think there might not be much. But I think I have enough on the end of this that a R8 collet should thread on this thing just fine. Well, that thread in the beginning is a lot looser than it should be, but quite frankly, I don't think it's going to matter. Uh, this should thread into that input spindle uh, a lot deeper than that. So I don't think I'm going to worry about it or remake this part. What I will do is go ahead and flip this around the other end, clean it off, and chamfer it to get ready to be pinned to uh, the stock, the one-inch stock that we started in the last step. Well, I've got our one inch piece of stock here that we started before and I've got a 5C collet block adapter that will mount it into to get ready to mill the hex on it with the milling machine. Well, I've got a four flute end mill in the spindle. We'll raise the knee here till we touch off and I'll zero out the DRO and then we'll lower it until we're going to take off enough material to give us uh, a three-quarter inch hex on the end. And that should work just fine. I'm loosening this uh, collet block here so I can flip this material around in order to finish machining the opposite end. I'm going to put a machinist jack underneath this round bar just to give it a little more stability and uh, it, keep it from moving as we drill through both of these pieces at the same time. Let's go ahead and give this thing a try. I did have to remove the pneumatic driver of my power draw bar and remove the draw bar that's normally in there. I've got it sort of resting in the vise here just to give it a little bit of stability and might make it a little bit easier. And I'm tightening down on that center screw and that spreads that casting apart. I'm lowering the quill and I can adjust now the Y axis until the quill slides all the way down and it will seat down into the bottom of the housing. Well the next trick here is to get that draw bar threaded into the input spindle of the attachment. So it takes a little bit of finagling here with the quill uh, but once it finds that sweet spot the draw bar will start threading into the input shaft on the right angle milling attachment. Once I have the draw bar seated, I can remove the pressure on that jacking bolt and then go ahead and tighten down the clamping bolts. Well, this is the first time trying this, so we'll just click it on real quick before turning it on and letting it run here for a little bit. I don't have the arbor support that is uh, often accompanied with these attachments that mounts to the dovetail of the bridge port. But I don't think I would probably ever need that since I do have the K&T horizontal. I think this would, this attachment I think will come in handy for other operations. Probably mostly for using slitting saws or some occasional side milling that's inconvenient for me to use the K&T for. 
if I loosen these clamp bolts, it'll let me spin this around on the spindle. And that gives me an opportunity to dial this in. It's got these machined surfaces that run uh, parallel with the spindle. And I can use those in a dial indicator to set these at whatever angle I need to set them at. So it does have quite a lot of flexibility that I don't necessarily have with the KT without uh, using the KT's universal milling head, which at the time of this video is still under a repair slash rebuild status. Well, as long as we got this thing mounted in the middle, let's go ahead and set a dial indicator on this machine surface and dial it in parallel with the x-axis with the long side of the table and we'll run a couple of tests. Well, it looks like it's probably within about a half a thousandth or so over the length, and I think that's accurate enough for what we're going to do with it. For this first operation, we'll do a little side drilling. So I've got my chuck here, and we'll mount it in the spindle. I've got a socketed cap screw for a drawbar, and I'll just tighten it down with a nice big Allen key wrench. Well, as my test here, I've got this longer piece of material. It's kind of odd shaped and I want to put a hole in the top of it as it's oriented here in the video. And it's really not something that I can chuck in the lathe. Uh, yeah, I could probably stand it up and put it on some angle plate, but I don't even think that would be easy to line up. I think using a right angle attachment like this certainly makes this operation a lot easier and maybe even a lot more accurate. One interesting thing to note here is because of the bevel gears cause a direction change, I have to run the spindle of the mill in the opposite direction than I would normally expect to. Another operation might be milling a, a slot in the end of a piece of material like this. Again, it's not something I think is easy to set up in a mill. Um, I don't know how else I would cut this unless I was doing it in the shaper, and that might take a little bit of extra setup as well. And if this piece was any longer, I'm not even sure if I could fit it in the shaper, uh, at least not rigid enough to be able to mill this slot and have it come out reasonably accurate. And removing this is just the reverse of installing it. I'll, I'll crank down on that uh, jack bolt that spreads the housing apart. And then I just need to loosen the drawbar, and this thing will come 
right off and ready to put it away on the shelf for when I need it. Well, this is one of those tools that I think it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. I think this will come in handy in some situations, but it probably won't be something I use very often. Well, that's going to be it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. Drop a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you're a subscriber, I thank you. And if you're not, hit that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. And with the bell icon, if you click that, you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.